It's 2.45. I'm calling our meeting. Uh, back to order, please. Sorry, my voice is like going somewhere new this afternoon. Uh, some, someday it might come back, but it's been gone. Some part of it's been gone for two months now. Uh, we're to agenda item five, which is the germane to regulation of the practice of law and computing the Keller deduction. Uh, Julie Shanklin, who was uh, ill last, at our last meeting, is able to be here, and she will be presenting, uh, and not Jean McElroy. Welcome, Julie, and thank you. Thank you. All right. This should be short and crystal clear because the law in this area is absolutely easy to understand and crystal clear. <laughs> okay. Um, I was told that you want me to focus on how to determine chargeability, non-chargeability, not on the specific procedures that WSBA uses. I will comment just because I can that WSBA's procedures were just were approved and described by Judge Robart in 2017 as providing robust procedural safeguards. They're also in Article 15 of the bylaws. Um, the general rule in this area, as you probably already know, was adopted by the U.S. Supreme Court decision in State Bar versus um, sorry in Keller versus State Bar of California. Um, as a mandatory integrated bar, WSBA may constitutionally use license fees to fund activities germane to regulating the legal profession and improving the quality of legal services. WSBA may not use mandatory license fees to fund activities of a political or ideological nature that are not necessarily or reasonably incurred for the purpose of regulating the legal profession or improving the quality of legal services provided to the people of Washington. So in describing the crystal clear test that it adopted, the court said precisely where the line falls between those state bar activities in which the officials and members of the bar are acting essentially as professional advisors to those ultimately charged with the regulation of the legal profession on one hand and those activities having political or ideological coloration which are not reasonably related to the advancements of such goals. Um, on the other, will not be easy to discern. The extreme ends of the spectrum are clear. Compulsory dues may not be expended to endorse or advance a gun control or nuclear weapons freeze initiative. At the other end, petitioners have no valid constitutional objection to their compulsory dues being spent for activities connected with disciplining members of the bar or proposing ethical codes for the profession. Right? Okay. Fortunately, there's a little bit, a little bit more. There are three cases that have helped interpret the test. One is, and I noticed some of these are not on your list, so I will definitely get these cases so that you have them. Pope Joy versus New Mexico Board of Bar Commissioners. Um, it's a 1995 case. Uh, it's a district court case. It was a challenge by bar members to the use of compulsory dues. In this case, the district court actually found some violations, and an impartial decision maker was appointed to um, determine the chargeability issues. And so the case actually talks about the chargeability standard. And it says, of course, even if a given activity possesses communicative content of a political or ideological nature, it may nonetheless be reasonably related to the practice of law, to the regulation of the legal system, or to the improvement of legal services. Um, and then it, it says, Justice Gordon, that was the impartial decision maker's refusal to strike down activities of some political or ideological content was not only appropriate but necessary if the bar is to be permitted to pursue its legitimate goals. Then it goes on a little later, it is impossible to allow mandatory state bars to pursue such broad objectives as regulating the legal profession or improving the delivery of legal services or to permit activities that are germane to the practice of law without at the same time approving of activities that will inevitably carry some ideological or political baggage. Unless the Supreme Court is willing to overrule Keller and recast mandatory bars permissible pursuits, compulsory financial support of some activities with at least a modicum of ideological content is inevitable. 
again, crystal clear, right? It, yeah, I think they're all actually helpful, which is why my approach actually is just going to be kind of reading you some of these descriptions, because I think they are helpful. And then in the end, I'll actually go through some examples. Um, so I think that will help. Um, in Gardner versus State Bar of Nevada, which was a case where bar members challenged the state bar's public information and education campaign, which I find to be interesting. The bar members did not want the bar to convince the public that lawyers were good. Um, <coughs> but that was the case. So what this case says is, undoubtedly every effort to persuade public opinion is political in a broad sense of that term. However, what Keller found objectionable was not political activity, but partisan political activity, as well as ideological campaigns unrelated to the bar's purpose. Um, and then it says, what the Supreme Court held objectionable in Leonard was education about the teaching profession unconnected to the collective bargaining function of the union. And you heard a little bit about Leonard in the earlier presentation, but the court here seems to be very focused on is it germane or not you know if it's the union was not permitted to have a public relations campaign essentially because it was not germane to their purpose which is limited to the collective bargaining agreement but here the bar's purposes are broader and so this campaign fits in <clears throat> to those purposes um and then the last thing that might be helpful is from, oh, I have two more things. So we had um, a Keller arbitration about our 2018 Keller deduction, oh, and right. the arbitrator framed the question this way. The question becomes, if there are political hues to the discussions taking place at WSBA public forums, or in the pages of Northwest Lawyer, are these merely inevitable baggage or are they the primary payload? And then I know you've read... Was that uh, Judge Downing? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to tell it's him, isn't it? <clears throat> I kind of remember appointing him, but I just recognize that prose would be similar to what he might say. Yes, his decision... just wanted to give him a shout out. <laughs> Um, and I know you've read the the recent uh, magistrate decision um, and findings recommending dismissal of the Gruber case, but there's a really, I think, a good description in here, too. As noted above, Keller permits the use of compulsory membership dues to fund speech germane to regulating the legal profession and improving the quality of legal services. Arguably, the statement attributed to the bar, so let me just pause for a moment. You all know about what the content was that was challenged in Gruber? I know you do. Well, it might be helpful just given we don't know who's listening okay. online or watching the thing for you just to give a brief description. And we do, we gained some time by one of the presentations being shorter than we expected. Okay. So feel free to describe it just as okay. you would. So it was two pages in the middle of their bar journal. One page was a statement by the state bar, which we'll, you'll hear described. Um, and the across the fold page was a statement by the, um, I believe they call them specialty bars. And theirs had a little bit more politically colored language in it. Um, but the statements could be read as separate or they could be read as connected. And those are the two statements that were at issue that caused some of the bar members in Oregon to challenge. So that's what this is describing. Arguably, the statement attributed to the bar in the April 2018 bar bulletin is germane to that purpose, being regulating the legal profession or improving the quality of legal services. Plaintiffs assert the statement is non-germane political speech that condemns the proliferation of speech that incites violence and advocates taking action to stop such speech. But to the extent, extent such an interpretation is reasonable, it was made within the specific context of promotion of access to justice, the rule of law, and a healthy and functional judicial system that equitably serves everyone. 
the bar remains committed to equity and justice for all and to vigorously promote the law as the foundation of a just democracy. That's a quote from the language in the, in the bar journal. Uh, this is germane to improving the quality of legal services. And then it goes on. The specialty bar's statement, appearing alongside the bar's statement in the April 2018 bar publication, is not a statement by the bar, but instead a statement authored by seven affinity bars announcing their support of the bar's statement, along, <coughs> among other statements. Although the specialty bar's statement included rhetoric critical of the president, the bar bulletin routinely publishes statements from a variety of authors with differing political viewpoints and creates a forum for the exchange of ideas pertaining to the practice of law. This service also is germane to improving the quality of legal services. So I thought that was actually pretty helpful. So if you look at the dictionary... Political is defined as of or concerned with government, the state, or politics, engaged in taking sides in politics. And that seems to be kind of where we're headed. If the main payload of the message is to convince someone to take a side on a particular political issue that's different from creating a a place where you can discuss all sides of an issue related to the practice of law, even if it's colored with politics. And the definition of ideology, of course, an activity related to ideology, really, a thinking characteristic of an individual group or culture, the integrated assertions, theories, and aims that constitute a socio-political program. So when... WISBA starts to figure out how this affects us. We, of course, look at General Rule 12.1, the regulatory objectives, and General Rule 12.2, WISBA's purposes and authorized activities, and that determines the set of responsibilities delegated, delegated to WISBA and kind of sets up a framework for evaluating whether a specific activity is germane to regulating the legal profession or improving the quality of legal services here. So I was going to do a few examples, and I will definitely commend footnote two to you and if you haven't read it in color, because it talks about some of the things that the California Bar was doing that were um, upsetting their members. They were endorsing a gun control initiative, endorsing a nuclear weapons freeze initiative, and prohibiting the possession of armor-piercing handgun ammunition. So you can see where um, Gardner then would say Keller was concerned with partisan political activity unrelated to the bar's purpose. I don't think there's a lot of argument there. And in Gardner... So again, it was a public information campaign, and it was found to be fine, um, or it was found to be chargeable. Let me say that. I don't know if it was found to be fine. But the description of it is kind of interesting. In response to a report, the Board of Governors in March 1998, this is um, in Nevada, approved a public information and education campaign and the hiring of a public relations person to conduct it. $200,000 were budgeted in furtherance of this campaign. The Professionalism Committee of the Bar adopted as a campaign message, Nevada lawyers, making the law work for everyone. Um, so they, that message was, that slogan was on billboards, on radio and television commercials, on all the bar publication, including Mr. Gardner's bar certification card, which apparently really irritated him. Um, so that was uh, found to be a chargeable activity. And again, so the, the distinction between that um, and Leonard is, has to do with the broadness of the mission that we're talking about. And then finally, going back to Gruber... So, interestingly, at the so I read you some quotes in Gruber. Maybe I don't need to repeat them. You know, 
the example in Gruber, the um, the minority bars or the specialty bars statement definitely contains some language that could be interpreted to be political comments, as they said, rhetoric critical of the president. So to me, that's where the difficulty comes in. When you have something um, that is probably perceived differently even by bar members, then trying to apply these rules is difficult. And again, Judge Downing um, was pointing out that just because you talk about something like the death penalty doesn't, unless you're talking specifically about the statute, doesn't necessarily make it political or make it not related to the regulation of the practice of law and improving legal services. But he kind of says, well, yeah, but law might be boring for the public. And if we really want to encourage education and teach people about the law and help them understand it, we have to do it in a context of um, the, the issues that are before them and the issues that are interesting to them. But that creates this this balancing test then that the court has created between a little bit of political content and this germaneness test. So I hope that's helpful. Questions? Turn on my mic questions. Eileen. You can count on me. I, I have two two questions. One is sort of narrow. Um, Judge Downing's and I think the Robert ruling, I thought I heard they were um, in, one of them was in April 2018, and Janice was in June. Do you see, that's the first question, Janice having implications for those earlier rulings? And my second part is, am I correct that you are, or, what the cases seem to suggest is that political would be perhaps defined as a specific law or issue uh, on which the Bar Association or a member with the Bar publication is taking a position for or against. But if it's not in that specific content, you think it context, excuse me, then you would not necessarily see these cases as saying it's political? I mean, it's hard for me to understand after the teacher union case where they said everything they do is political, right? to be able to say that what lawyers do <laughs> isn't political. So the, the answer may be actually more in the germane, germaneness test, right, in your answer to number two, because Teachers' unions may have a more narrow um, task than the Bar Association. If you look at GR 12.2, the Bar is tasked with a lot of things, right? And so when you're trying to determine whether it's related to the, to the purposes, it could be that the Bar's purposes are broader. And so that could be how you get to a probably a broader definition of what is related. And the case law only requires a reasonable relationship between. That's what Keller says. It says necessary or reasonably related to, and then it lists the compelling government interests in, in regulating. And your first question about Janice. So... I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't know if Janice will apply to bar associations. I think it provides a wonderful opportunity for the court to talk about and make a decision about are we going to stick with the union cases or are we different from the union cases. Um, collective bargaining is all about kind of um, the terms and conditions of employment. That's much narrower, I think, than the bar's mission right now. If the bar's mission changes, to me, the whole analysis changes because that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the speech, which could be political, and I hear what you're saying. It makes sense to me. If you're arguing anything budgetary, I, th I think it's by definition political because you're saying I'm more important and these other things are not, right? 
that makes sense. Um, I don't know if that's the same analysis that you apply to bar association speech. I think there's definitely a public education piece to it that may not be political. You could educate the public about issues using <clears throat> political-ish topics as an example, but you're not taking a position on should there be a death penalty, should there not. You know, if you're discussing case law that talks about the death penalty, that seems to me to be completely related to the practice of law and advancing legal services, but it's not necessarily politically partisan. Does that help or is it worse? I see it as a point of view. I, I think there could be a larger question of if you make the bar's purposes political, then you kind of defeated the, the oh. education portion. And certainly I think there have been positions taken that, that would be described as political. The, the most recent in, would be joining the – and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just asking – because from my perspective, I don't want the Washington State Bar to be the test case for the U.S. Supreme Court Me decides whether or not Keller lives or dies. And, um, but I think you could certainly say that uh, the minute they man mention a, a political figure, an elected figure, uh, as, and criticize that, that there's a political thread running through. Are you talking about Oregon? Yes. <clears throat> but I – Yes. Yeah, but it was found by the, I mean, the recommendation is to dismiss the lawsuit, to, so to find it to be chargeable. Which then, of course, can open up the, the line to the Supreme Court. Yeah. So, and it's just, the it was the magistrate judge, so the district court judge hasn't weighed in yet, to our knowledge. Is that correct, Kyle? Yeah. So we just have a magistrate recommendation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to uh, Fred, and then I, I'm going to come back to myself. Fred. I think you, you talked about Article 15 of the bylaws, and maybe that's where the procedure for grievances comes up. Yes. So my compound question is, where do I find the memorialization of the procedures, and could you summarize those procedures for me? Uh, I will try to summarize them. So members have a right to object to the bar's um, calculation of the Keller deduction on an annual basis. The, the bar provides um, a, an explanation of how it was calculated, um, and that actually is typically done um, not only to the members, but there is a memo every year that is in the, the Board of Governors book. They, they approve that typically, I think, in September. So members can, they just send in and I object and here's what I object to. And then there is an impartial arbitrator appointed and there's an arbitration. So in 2018, we had seven or eight. Okay, and, and that's in Article 15? So sets... Yeah, if you look in Article 15 of the bylaws, it sets out the whole procedure. Thank you. You're welcome. And normally the bar determines the dollar amount and then the person objects to the dollar amount. So you can... So my understanding is Keller, the bar comes up with an amount that they think is the Keller deduction. You can choose to pay the full amount or ask for, and historically it's been a few dollars. Um, and then if you don't think that captures it, then you're able to object, and then that is what I think the arbitrator looks at. Mm -hmm. And I, as the chief, appoint the arbitrator um, and, this, 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 and we haven't had had a request for arbitration to my, and at least I've only been chief two years, but last year was the first year I was like, oh, I get to do this and, <laughs> and did it. Um, so uh, just a supplement to that answer. Do you have a supplement to my supplement? N no, I was only going to say um, the case law talks about, you know, you need to um, – have an escrow. The, the amount in dispute has to be an escrow, but in our system, the member just retains that amount, and then they have to pay it depending on the decision. And then I go back, not related to that question, but myself in line, was thinking about sort of political um, is, I think, sort of becomes whether it's more of an advocacy 
uh, advocacy role on what would be considered a political decision. And I know a number of years ago, uh, the Bar Board of Governors took positions on some subjects that then resulted in a conversation with the Supreme Court as to why they thought that was not political and concerns. And my recollection it was it was marijuana and the death penalty were am I or is would you remember what the two were, Mark? You remember same sex marriage. Same sex marriage and the death penalty. And there were studies and then there was a concern, of course, as a mandatory unified bar that of course once you start taking positions that arguably everything's related to the practice of law. That's why law is so interesting. And if you take that definition, then it can be quite concerning because then nothing is not related to the practice of law. But some issues are more political and people have strong feelings on both sides and we could probably come up with what they are. And so there was some concern then by members and by uh, the Supreme Court, given the GR as to taking, not being involved in political activities, uh, as to that uh, action and how that was viewed and whether that brought us into some concern about the bar being political versus being. Um, so I think your example of having a CLE on the death penalty, we're having it, we have many CLEs now, of course, on um, ma marijuana, legalization of marijuana, what that means, et cetera. Um, there's a line between education or information or even legislation you might be involved in, how the procedures or how it plays out. But when it looks like an organization is taking a position when you're a mandatory organization, then that's where I think you, you start bringing yourself into trouble, into more scrutiny. I guess I would say. So I think that is sort of, at least historically, where there's been some uh, understanding of what's political or what is uh, not sort of as directly related to the practice of law. Does anyone want to add anything to that, Julie or others who were here during the, those times? Not everyone agrees, but, there, but, that, but those were the conversations we were having at that time about it. Okay. Any other questions for Julie? Any on? We have any? Nothing online. Okay. Anything in the room? All right. Thank you very much, Julie. And I'm glad you're feeling better. Too. Thank you.